The victims were Tina Brandon of Lincoln, Philip Devine of Fairfield, Iowa, and Lisa Lambert of Humboldt. She lived at the farmhouse with her infant son who was not harmed in the attack. Tina Brandon posed as a man named Brandon. The beautiful thing about Tina was he was in touch with his female side and his male side. He knew what females wanted because he was a female at one time. And he knew what males wanted because now he was a male. If um, Brandon really was a man, oh Jesus, he would have women after him all the time. I mean, he knew how to please you. He knew how to do everything right. A excellent kisser, excellent, excellent guy. Knew exactly how a woman wanted to be treated. Changes I'm going through in my life will change me forever. One of these nights I'll close my eyes and let everything go. I'm not as strong as I thought. I can't fight. I don't think I can make it alone. By Brandon. Hello there, my crime cult. It's Breland here. Happy Pride to ya! Today I'm going to be telling the extremely tragic story of Brandon Tina previously known as Tina Brandon, a female to male transgender man who was hate crimed in 1993 rural Nebraska. I remember seeing the movie Boys Don't Cry starring Hilary Swank. I feel like the movie is more like an outline of Brandon's real life because there's so many details, twists and turns that aren't mentioned in the movie but I gotcha because I'm going to be mentioning as many details as I possibly can. So let's start out with Brandon's parents. Joanne Brandon is his mom and she had to grow up pretty fast because she became a mother very early in her life. At the age of 14, she gave birth to her first daughter, Tammy Brandon. At first, she would stay home, take care of the baby, and just be a typical housewife. She was also married to her husband, Patrick Brandon. So soon after she was pregnant and had Tammy Brandon, Tina Renee Brandon, her second daughter, came along. So Brandon was born in Lincoln, Nebraska on December 12th, 1972, and his mom was actually 16 at the time. So she had both of her kids about a year apart. They were very close in age. So Brandon's life started with tragedy as it had ended. His father, who liked to be called Pat, Patrick Brandon, he was only 19 years old. He was a teen dad. He was very young, April 7th, 1972. This was eight months before Brandon would be born. Pat was traveling along Highway Route 6, and he was in a convertible with a friend. It was around 2 a.m. They ran off the road. They skidded onto the shoulder. The car just began to flip ejecting both passengers out of the convertible and unfortunately Brandon's father didn't make it. Since this was eight months before Brandon was born, I personally assume that Joanne Brandon had no idea she was even pregnant at the time. So after Patrick's demise, Joanne struggled to take care of her two kids being a widow. After Pat had passed away, Joanne began to receive benefits, which would go to help take care of both children. Unfortunately, the benefits just weren't enough, so Joanne had to get a retail job in order to pay her bills every month. So Brandon was unfortunately plagued with illnesses when he was younger. He would develop colds, and he even got pneumonia. He caught mononucleosis, which really did a number on him. And luckily, he did grow out of constantly being sick. And not only that, his mom did go on to remarry a guy. His name was, I think his name was Jug. And Jug was actually the only father figure 
that Brandon truly knew. Like I said, he never knew his real father. He was born without a father. Brandon would even call him daddy. This was a really good man. He treated Brandon like gold along with his sister Tammy. They were a very happy family for a while, but unfortunately Jug became extremely controlling over Joanne. So she later got a divorce when Brandon was eight years old. So Brandon was really upset about the divorce, but his mom made sure to allow him to go and spend time with Jug after the divorce, but Jug ended up getting remarried and Brandon did not like his wife very much. I don't know if maybe she treated him bad or what, and in the end, Jug chose his wife over Brandon, and Brandon was so devastated he never spoke of Jug again. So as Brandon grew into the young boy that he was on the inside, he became quite the prankster. He loved to make people laugh. He was really just like an easygoing guy. In school, he would play pranks on people like all of his fellow classmates. He just loved to bring joy and laughter into people's lives. Joanne also described Brandon as being a tomboy. So it's clear that she could tell that Brandon was a little bit different from all of the other girls out there. He tried to present as masculine as he possibly could. So to help aid in looking even more masculine, Brandon absolutely loved sports. He loved basketball and football. He loved to work out. He was like any other young boy, but unfortunately he was living in a female body. There came a time where Brandon started to go through puberty. He became disgusted with himself. He started to develop breasts. He started to develop like more of a womanly curvy figure. He was not cool with this. He was freaking out about it. He did not want anything to do with any sort of femininity. Brandon also went to a Catholic school as his mother did when she was younger. It just got to the point to where the school was really strict, so when he was a sophomore, he dropped out of high school and just moved in with one of his girlfriends. It was at this point that Brandon truly started to experiment with his sexuality, and he had been living with his girlfriend named Tracy Beals, and she became rather abusive when he moved in, so he had to eventually move out of there and move back in with his mom. After moving back in with his mom in 1990, he re-enrolled in high school and did his best to try to finish it. It's also reported that Brandon actually had several boyfriends in school. I assume he was experimenting just to see what he truly liked. And he even kissed boys. He had crushes on some boys. The whole boy phase only lasted for a very short time because, as we all know, Brandon loved the ladies. He was even a ladies' man. So by his senior year in high school, Brandon really started to rev up in presenting male. He even went a step further further by dropping his dead name or the name given by his mother and changing his name to Billy Brinson and then later changing it to just Brandon. At this point he bound his chest. He also used a ball of socks in his crotch region to make it appear as a male bulge down there and then he eventually graduated to a rubber penis, which he would use this to be intimate with all of his unknowing girlfriends. He really started to flourish by allowing himself to be the man that he's always wanted to be. He was finding some kind of happiness in this, but unfortunately, his mom was not so happy about her daughter presenting as male. She was in denial. She refused to use his preferred pronouns along with his preferred name. She said that Tina is my daughter and she will always be my daughter. So unfortunately, with all the drama in Brandon's life, he never finished high school. 
It seems like he was more interested in love and butterflies and girls than he was in his academics. I feel like he was obsessed with getting some form of acceptance, even if it was through girlfriends and women who maybe didn't even know that he was born female. Since he couldn't get any type of acceptance from his mom, he went through a lot of relationships. So Brandon's male identity was described as kind of like a rugged cowboy and an athletic jock. I mean, his jawline was cut. He was hot. I 100% believe he was male on the inside and it truly showed on the outside. So towards the end of his senior year of high school, Brandon started to miss so many days of school that eventually they expelled him three days before his high school graduation. So he was also constantly harassed and bullied because of the way he presented. A lot of people in his town knew who he was and knew that he was supposedly a she and they would just treat him really horribly. So with the lack of support and this constant harassment and bullying from his peers. He was put down. He was called a fag. Or worse yet, oh, you're a dyke. Oh, you're really a lesbo. That's what you are. You're a lesbo. We don't want to be around you. He became extremely depressed and decided that he was out. He was done. So he attempted to take his own life. So because of this attempt, he was placed in the Lancaster County Crisis Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. He stayed here for around two to three days and spoke to a psychiatrist about his identity issues and childhood trauma, and eventually the psychiatrist diagnosed him with a gender identity crisis and personality disorder. After being released from the crisis center, he did a few more of the outpatient appointments with the therapist, but he quit the therapy and just went on about his merry little way. So after dropping out of high school and his life-taking attempt, he just continued to seek love and validation from others, as he always had. He'd forge checks from his family members, including his sister. He would get into all sorts of fights with his sister. He'd steal her checks and go and buy, like, crazy stuff, especially for his girlfriends, to, I guess, get that validity and get that acceptance from them when he gives them a gift. He thrived on that rush of getting acceptance and validity from someone receiving a gift. One of his ex-girlfriends did an interview talking about how Brandon had stolen her credit card and went out and bought an engagement ring and asked her to marry him. The funniest thing was he had bought me an engagement ring set on that card. It was the actual gold band, the other ring being the diamond solitaire. <laughs> you know, at this time I've already figured out this is my card. He's like, well, I bought this for you. I said, with what? Well, with my money. And I said, you did no such thing. I said, you're giving me a ring that I just bought myself. You know, am I right? <laughs> and so we'd argued and fought over that, and I'd said, take the ring. I just throw it at him. I don't want it. I do not want it. I said, tell you what, right now, you know, engagement's off. He thought it was okay because it made her happy. His heart was in the right place, even though he was doing the wrong things. So in 1993, Brandon was charged with theft and forgery for all of these crazy things that he was doing. Some of his ex-girlfriends described him as a pathological liar, but then they also say he was very sweet and kind, considerate. He was just an overall great guy. They said he meant well, but he was hurting others in the process. So at this point, Brandon's 20 years old. He's got a whole line of charges and warrants for his arrest. He also has a few court dates that he skipped out on, and that's not a good idea because that's how you receive warrants when you skip out on your court dates. He decided to dip out and go somewhere that nobody knew him. So he decided to go down to Fall City, Nebraska. It's a very, very small rural town. Fall City is a white community. 
Then having gay people come in, you know, Fall City would, I'm sure, you know, escort them out of town. This was a very dangerous place to get outed. So for the first few months in Fall City, he started to present himself as Brandon. He even had a fake ID that said his male name on it. So as Brandon went out and socialized more, he ended up meeting a group of friends in town who were also around his age. One of those friends being Lisa Lambert. And because Brandon was super fly and chill, he was very charming, like he knew how to swoon the ladies. So Lisa invited Brandon to come and live with her at her farmhouse. She would always be the one to take people in. She was a very kind-hearted person. Lisa was also a single mom with an eight-month-old baby named Tanner Lambert. Her farmhouse was in Humboldt, Nebraska, which was in an even tinier part of Nebraska. Neither of these places were ideal for someone like Brandon. But regardless, he accepted her offer and moved in. So in the fall of 1993, Brandon, Lisa, and her baby Tanner all lived at her farmhouse. And Brandon would always shower Lisa with compliments about how great of a mom she was and how he would just love to adopt Tanner. So Brandon really loved children, and Lisa would always dote about how Brandon was so good with Tanner. Eventually, Lisa Lambert and Brandon did have a drunken night or two of intimacy. Lisa did say that they hooked up, but she had absolutely no clue that Brandon was born a female. So it seemed like a hook, line, and sinker for Lisa because she really liked Brandon, they got along great, he loved the kid, but Tanner was extremely high strung. Tanner cried a lot and this kind of annoyed Brandon, so he started to distance himself from Lisa and Tanner. So Lisa had some old friends who were also convicts that Brandon met up with at the bar and partied with, and those friends were John Lauder, Marvin Tom Neeson, and 17-year-old Lana Tisdall. Lana was actually John Lauder's ex-girlfriend. And since they would all frequently hang out together, Brandon and Lana started to have more of a cozy relationship. And eventually that led to intimacy. So Lana eventually had Brandon stay at her house with her sister Leslie and their mom Linda. They were much like Lisa when it came to allowing misfits in the neighborhood or drifters to crash on their couch if they needed a place to stay. It was kind of like a community vibe there. Brandon didn't talk bad about anybody and he was very considerate to my daughter Lana. I liked him, he was very appealing for a young man. So Brandon accepted the offer and began living with Lana and her family. Now let's talk about John Lauder. He was an extremely obnoxious, outspoken, meth addict sort of person, and he was very good friends with Marvin Tom Neeson. So Tom Neeson was John's bestie. They always hung out and drank and did drugs together. And they would often invite Brandon over for like a guy's night out, drinking and smoking. Oh, we went out drinking together. We talked about women. We'd ride around and say, ooh, what about that one? Mm -hmm. What about that one there, you know? You know, just guy talk. Tom and John would cause chaos wherever they went. And it's also reported that some locals had warned Brandon about Tom and John and said that they could get extremely violent. It was also a rumor that Tom had SA'd women in the past. So Brandon just ignored all of these red flags and warning signs, but regardless, Brandon was just on cloud nine because he had just found his people. He was having so much fun. Nobody knew that he was born female. He was in love. He had Lana Tisdall, which was like his sweetheart. And he was just on top of the world at this point. He shaved. He would like sit like a man. And he would, you know, talk about women, like pretty women on TV. 
His favorite woman he thought was really beautiful was Cher. It was really nice being treated like a lady instead of just like nothing, like dirt. It was different. What goes up must unfortunately come crashing down. And that's exactly what happened. So in December of 1993, Brandon was arrested for hot checks. After being arrested, he was placed in the Richardson County Women's Jail. Dear Mom, as of right now, I'm in the Falls City County Jail. I've been so lost lately, I can't even cry. Love you always and forever, Brandon. His arrest was also made public in the local newspaper. In the newspaper, they named him as Tina Renee Brandon, 21 years old, and they also listed him as a female. So on December 20th, Brandon went to court on his charges. He had stayed in jail for about five days ever since he was arrested and Lana came up with the money to bail him out. But since Lana was a minor at the time, she had to get her good old ex-boyfriend buddy, John Lauder, to proceed with the bail. I was like, well, if he's not Brandon, then who is he? And he's, she said, Brandon is not a he. Brandon is a she, and Brandon's real name is Tina Brandon. I like, there's no way. I said, that is not a woman. I said, it doesn't even look like a woman. After Brandon was bailed out, Lana started to question him. So Brandon, of course, lied to Lana and told her that he was, in fact, a hermaphrodite and that he had both male and female genitalia. Lana later started to question, just in her own mind, their intimate relations together. She later realized that Brandon would always turn the lights out and she had never actually seen him in the full flesh before. Lana also realized Brandon never ejaculated. If a man does that in you, you know it, because afterwards, it all comes out. I guess he's a damn good actor when it comes to this. He's had a lot of practice. Lana also claimed to have seen Brandon's breasts whenever he bent over in the prison uniform. She saw cleavage and for a split second, she thought she was just imagining things, but would later realize she wasn't. So now we're on Christmas Eve of 1993. Tom Neeson invites everybody over to his house to have like a little Christmas party or get together. It's said that Lana and Brandon were being very affectionate on the couch there at the party. John started getting annoyed because they were constantly kissing and stuff. And I feel like he was really jealous, possibly obsessed with Lana. She was his ex-girlfriend after all. They both, him and Tom, started picking on Brandon and saying, just tell us the truth, you're a girl, blah, blah, blah. And Brandon said, cut it out, just stop, you know. He also started to insinuate that he was horny and I guess insinuate that he wanted Brandon to do things with him because he was supposedly a girl. So things calmed down and Lana decided to go ahead and go home that night to spend Christmas with her mom and her sister. After Lana leaves, Brandon stays at Tom's house with Tom along with John Lauder. This was such a mistake. I can't believe that he was okay staying after all of this happened, but you know, alcohol was involved, who knows what was going on. And of course, John and Tom started their shit again. Tom and John both demanded the truth from Brandon. They were like, tell us the truth, we know you're a girl. Eventually, Brandon pushed Tom and it started to get physical. They both grabbed Brandon and drug him to the bathroom and locked the door. At this point, John Lauder, Tom Neeson, and Brandon are all three locked inside the bathroom to where Brandon cannot escape. Brandon said, okay, okay, I'll show you, just give me a second. And Tom and John were not cool with that. They weren't satisfied. So John held Brandon's arms above his head while Tom pulled down his pants. Tom was pulling down her pants and he put his finger up there and said, oh, there ain't nothing there. there was, she's a girl, you know. And I said, well, I saw something. You know, I looked at Brandon and I said, what was it I saw? 
So after assaulting Brandon, Tom and John were even more pissed when they found out that Brandon was definitely not a male. So they forced Brandon into the car and drove over to Lana's mom's house. John went in and told Lana's mom, Linda, that he found out that Brandon was definitely a female. And this also pissed off Linda. And Linda said, he's no longer welcome in my home. So John leaves Linda's house, gets back in the car with Brandon and Tom, and they begin to drive towards this meatpacking plant. In the early morning hours of Christmas Day, Nissen and Lauder drove Brandon here to this Hormel plant. It's a place where hogs are loaded and it reeks of urine and manure. At night, it's dark and deserted. Here, Lauder and Nissen decided to teach Brandon, now exposed as Tina Brandon, a lesson for posing as a man. Brandon knew at this point that something horrible was about to happen. So Brandon said in his own words in a statement that John and Tom, both of them, brutally essayed him in the back seat of the vehicle. After they beat and brutally essayed Brandon, they picked him up, put him in the front seat of the car. Tom told Brandon, you're not going to tell anyone about this, right? Because if you do, we'll have to silence you forever. So Tom, along with John, threatened Brandon, do not go to the police. Do not tell anyone about what had happened. And Brandon agreed with them and said, I'll never tell anyone. So they go back to Tom's house and tell him to take a shower. Brandon begs them for privacy. He's like, please, please just let me have some time alone. Finally, Tom and John allow Brandon to stay locked in the bathroom, which is where Brandon got these very tiny moments to jump out the window and run to Lana and her mom's house. So once Brandon got to Lana's house and Brandon finally got the nerve to tell her that he was SA'd by Tom and John and Lana convinced Brandon that he needed to go to the police and file a report. So the next day, him and Lana went to the police station, which is where they took his statement and questioned him. Sheriff Lowe questioned Brandon about this incident in the most demeaning, disgusting way. He's such a pig. He was victim blaming, shaming. So here is the footage of Brandon's interview with Sheriff Lowe. All right, so after you pulled your pants down, I seen you as a girl when he did. Did he ponder you any? He didn't ponder you any, huh? Doesn't that kind of amaze you? After he you pulled your pants down, he'd been wanting to take you to bed, and you told him no, that you was a boy, and he couldn't do that. Doesn't that kind of get your attention somehow that he would have put his hands in your pants and play with you a little bit? Huh? I don't know why he did. I can't believe that if he pulled your pants down and you're a female, that he didn't stick his hands in you. Or your finger in you. I didn't. I can't believe he didn't. So when they got ready to poke you, how was your position in the back seat? On my back. He was on your back. What did he try to start in the first half? Oh, I don't know. He tried your pants down, and you say you never had sex before, is that correct? Right. And which one tried doing this first? Tom. And Tom couldn't get it in you? Huh? I said he couldn't, but... Alright. He said he couldn't get it in. Well, I know it hurt, so I said, no, Tom, it hurt. What area is going to hurt? First one was Tom, is that correct? Yes, sir. And then when John got the back seat, what did he do? He didn't do anything that Tom did. Alright. After he got his pants down, he got a spread of you, or had you spread out, and he got a spread of you then, then what happened? Did he have a hard on when he got back there, or what? I don't know. I didn't look. Did he take a little time working it up, or what? Did you work it up for him? No, I didn't. You didn't work it up for him? No. Then do you think he had it worked up on his own, or what? I guess so. I don't know. And you've never had any sex before? No. How old are you? And if you're 21, you think you'd have, you'd have trouble getting it in? You want to file charges against these guys? So that was the first tape. There's actually a second tape of this interrogation by Sheriff Lowe that 
mysteriously just disappeared into thin air. He even admitted later that he didn't believe Brandon at the time. Did you believe Tina Brandon when she told you she'd been? I questioned it a little bit, probably. Now, why did you question it? Because she was posing as a man. So on December 28th of 1993, the police department calls in John and Tom for questioning after Brandon's report. They denied everything. They said, she's lying. Sheriff Lowe believed them and they were let go. They did not get arrested. But at this point, the damage had already been done because now they know that Brandon reported them. There was ample probable cause at that time that these two young men had raped this girl, wasn't there? And you refused to arrest them. You should have, should have, probably. So Brandon went back to stay with Lisa for a few days just to lay low a little bit since he had made that report. He didn't want John and Tom to be able to find him. The only ones who knew where he was was Lana and her mom and sister. So John goes over to Lana's house and John has a G-U-N. So he threatened Linda and Lana and said, tell me where he is now. Unfortunately, Linda broke and told John where Brandon could be found. She also told him that whatever he does, he better get rid of any evidence. And she admitted to saying that in this interview. I told them what Brandon's accusations were and they were trying to tell me it was a bunch of bull. And then when I brought up the deal, I said, well, it's been reported, and if you guys did anything, you better get rid of your evidence. And Tom went to the kitchen, got a pan of soapy water and a rag, and washed up a little spot on the floor and on the wall. I knew for sure then that, that they were responsible for doing all this. So now we are on December 31st of 1993. It's around 1 a.m., and John Lauder, along with Tom Neeson, drive their vehicle down the winding road of Lisa Lambert's Humboldt farmhouse. John knocked on the door, and when no one answered, he busted the door open, runs in, and starts screaming, where's Brandon? Where's Brandon? They asked Lisa where Brandon was, and she refused to tell them where he was. So they continued to search the house until they found a very terrified Brandon underneath Lisa Lambert's bed. Tom and John drug Brandon out from underneath Lisa's bed. Lisa's still screaming and asking why are they doing this? Please don't hurt her baby. Brandon's even pleading for his life at this point. But unfortunately, John Lauder, being methed out, coked out, whatever he was, took the weapon, put it to Brandon's chin, and pulled the trigger. Bodily fluids squirted out everywhere, and Brandon fell to the ground. Brandon fell at the end of the bed with his legs hanging off. So it's almost like he was sitting at the end of the bed, but half of his body was laying down on the bed. So Tom had seen Brandon twitching. Tom runs over to John, grabs his K-N-I-F-E, and then runs back over to Brandon, grabs him by the shoulder, and begins him in the abdomen. Now that Brandon was, in fact, deceased, they had to take care of the witnesses. So Tom ended up firing at Lisa Lambert while she still had the baby in her arms. The shot only grazed her stomach, but she still freaked out and she gave the baby to John. John then puts the baby in the crib and then Tom proceeds to take Lisa's life with a shot directly through the eye. So another person that was there was the boyfriend of Lisa Lambert's sister. So they go in there, Philip pleads for his life. He says, I won't tell, I promise. They didn't care about his pleas. They had to get rid of the witnesses and they fired two shots into his head. After everyone was confirmed to be deceased, John and Tom abruptly left the house and drove away. 
So eight-month-old baby Tanner Lambert was unharmed. He was just left in his crib, and he's actually still alive and thriving to this day, I am happy to report. So being the stupid idiots that John and Tom were, they felt as though they needed to dispose of the evidence once they got back to Falls City. So they took the weapons they used, put them into a package, and threw them into a local river in Falls City. But what the coked out, methed out addicts failed to realize was it was the dead of winter. It was frozen, you dumbasses. So they basically just handed the evidence over to the police because when police went looking, it was right there on top of the river. So the next morning, Lisa's mom ends up discovering all the bodies along with an unharmed Tanner in his crib. So Tom and John were later arrested for all three of these homicides and charged. Tom got life in prison and John got the F penalty. Unfortunately, they're both still alive and they're serving their time. Later, Joanne Brandon sued the police department for wrongful F and she was awarded a hefty sum of money, but still nothing is worth your child's life. So Brandon was buried in Lincoln Memorial Park in Lancaster County, Nebraska. He was buried right next to his 19-year-old father who had passed away in 1972. Did you ever acknowledge this person, Brandon? No. You refused to acknowledge her right. as a man. And she would present herself as a boy to other girls. Right. But when they came around to our house, she was spoken to as Tina. So they knew, even though they deny it. I find it sad that Joanne refused to accept Brandon after his demise, thus giving him a gravestone that says his dead name along with his dead titles, such as daughter and sister, as you can see here. But I've got a little solution for that, so stay tuned for the end. So after all this happened, there was a journalist who wrote a very long article documenting his life and what exactly happened. This caught the eye of a Hollywood filmmaker who eventually would go on to produce and direct the movie Boys Don't Cry starring Hilary Swank. I highly recommend you watch the movie. It's gonna make you cry, especially if you're as passionate about this as I am. You should never have to hide who you really are. And that's what pride is about, is to be proud of who you are. I really hope you enjoy this outro, which is a memorial tribute to Brandon. So I thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye! <laughs>
Happy birthday.